Uh, good evening, friends, and uh, welcome to the fifth uh, Value Investing uh, Forum. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the panelists for joining us today. Uh, we have a very august uh, panel today with me. Uh, each of my panelists uh, have an experience of investing in the Indian markets uh, for several decades, uh, probably three decades or more. And the panel collectively uh, has an experience of over a century of actual investing experience uh, in the markets. Uh, the panel today will discuss uh, the learnings uh, from the Warren uh, Buffett letters, uh, which have been now published uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, Warren Buffett needs no introduction. He is uh, uh, the, uh, the most iconic uh, investor in the world, uh, an investor uh, who has taught uh, many other investors all over the world. <coughs> Uh, through his uh, process of investing, he's delivered a return of nearly 20% compounded uh, over the course of this 50 years versus a 10% return uh, in S&P 500, uh, which in turn has resulted in the Berkshire Hathaway that it is today, with a market cap of $350 billion, and in turn making him the world's uh, you know, third, largest, third richest uh, person. Uh, this year is a you know, special year in the sense that uh, They've come up with a triple edition uh, of the annual shareholders letter, uh, sharing all of the wisdom collected over the period of this 50 years, and also uh, for a change, sharing uh, their own outlook uh, for the future. Uh, the letter is obviously a must read for all of us. In fact, one of his dear friends, Bill Gates, read the letter, and he has read each of those 50 letters. And he commented after reading the letter that this is by far the best of the 50 letters that he has read, and he in turn is recommending each one of us to read these letters as well. It is uh, available freely on the Berkshire Hathaway website uh, to download and read. Uh, our panelists here today have not just read the 50th letter, but each of these 50 letters, uh, they have not just read the letters, but distilled the wisdom from those letters, and have actually practiced this in the Indian markets for the last many years. So, we're going to pick their brains on the frameworks uh, that they took away from these letters over the last 50 years. I want to start, start with Ramdev Ji. Ramdev Ji, you've already shared some of the frameworks that you've put to work in your wealth creation studies, the last 19 wealth creation studies. If you were to cull out just one out of these innumerable frameworks that Buffett has uh, shared, which one would you highlight as one that investors should really you know, focus on? I think. <clears throat> for investors, the very first and the most important one is rule number one, don't lose money, and rule number two, don't of forget course. rule number one. Of course. You know, I think that summarizes everything, whatever he has said, what he has done, and what we have to do. Yes. I mean, if you come to the markets, don't lose money ever. Yeah. Have a strategy or have selection process whereby, or pay the purchase price. I mean, one is the buying the stock, right stock, like buy right, set tight. It's basically the same thing. Yes. That... Uh, you buy the right stock at right price, and just you have to sit uh, through. So, uh, I think the though it looks very catchy, but there's a lot of wisdom in that particular saying. Rule number one: don't lose money. I mean, somebody asked him, "What what is the mantra of uh, making money in the stock market?" It is rule number one: don't lose money. Rule number two: don't forget rule number one. So, I think that summarizes everything. Right, right. And Sanjoy, what about you? Uh, you've uh You've shared quite a few of these frameworks with us over a period of, you know, last many years. Yeah, I should make a confession. I think a confession is in good order so that no one in the audience is fooled. I am actually not smart enough to practice most of what Buffett says. <laughs> so I'm actually much, much more <coughs> pedestrian in my approach. But it's true that I've read all that he has said. And I think it's actually very difficult for most people to try and behave like Buffett. Because... His temperament and his intellect are both abnormal. They're not easily found on the planet. I mean, there are very few guys who have it. Now, but just to come back, I think my, the one I really like and which has helped me personally, that's the, I think the only one which I practice, you know, regularly. It's almost like breathing for me. And I don't remember the exact quote, so, I, but I'll tell you what it says. It says, that if you find managers with very high energy and high degree of intelligence, but they don't have integrity, that's the most deadly combination you can find because they'll bleed you to death. <laughs> uh, 
And my experience over 25, 30 years in India is that India is sort of overflowing with such managers. I mean, we have <laughs> uh, countless such managers in this country, many of whom are worshipped and respected yeah. because people have been unable to recognize in short periods of time the damage that they can inflict. So for me, that's really, you know, and it, in a strange way, it ties in with Ramdev's first thought, which is fundamental to sensible investing, which is the idea of capital preservation. Yeah. If, you, if you preserve money, in other words, you don't lose money, rule number one, rule number two, he put it in an even more catchy way than what Ramdev said. And I'll tell you that one. I really love that saying. It is, if you want to finish first, first you must first finish. Right. So this is about a long distance race. So if you want to win the marathon, make sure you don't drop out along the way. And the way you drop out is if you encounter one of these crooks. Right. The crooks make you drop out because they destroy your wealth so badly that you don't finish. Yeah. So in a sense, the two are sort of related for me. This idea of capital preservation and investment results. Fantastic. Uh, Durkish Bhai, do you want to share uh, your favorite investment framework? Yeah, as uh, Sanjoy mentioned, the most important thing is that one needs to understand that although he is telling us a lot of things to do, most of us will find it difficult to follow. <laughs> and one of the things that I feel is most difficult to follow is the kind of focus he talks about. He talks about only 20 stocks in a lifetime. Lifetime. Yeah. So I think once somebody is going to start following what he's saying, he has to realize that he is talking about a serious focus. Whether you do 20 stocks or you do a little more than that. But to me, it looks like with that in mind, you obviously have to keep a focus on your purchases. Okay. Okay. Right. Fact, and, uh, and just to yeah, add. Yeah, so this is a big one. Uh, uh, in 95, 96, when I read first time, I had 225 stocks in my portfolio. Wow. <laughs> A to Z full because of bad deliveries and I mean, I, get, I could produce all those statements. I mean, you, you get tired after the first page, you know. So, uh, there was no, it was not possible to manage this to, to the, there was no management and there was no, uh, you didn't know uh, uh, what was your return and how well you are doing and all. Very first year after reading this, I understood the power of focus somewhere in 95, 96. And we brought it down one year, and that time this NSC came with the uh, trading. So if you sell 100 shares, your 100 shares will go delivery. It will be that del deleted. So that was the uh, gift at that point of time. We cleaned up, and from 225, we came to 16 shares. And uh, that very year, the portfolio doubled. Market didn't double, but we doubled. You know, so th that focus is a huge power because you can take care of only 15, 16 stocks. I've interviewed so many guys. I asked them how many stocks your 60 stocks. I said, ask, write the names. They can't go beyond 1230. No, I think just if I may explain what Durgesh said, he's, uh, it's absolutely true and I think one of the most important things. But in simple terms, I'll tell you why what Durgesh said is so powerful and so difficult as well. See, in investing, the more decisions you make, the greater the likelihood you will make a mistake. So if you cut the number of decisions you have to make and the decisions that you make are after really deep thought, you're improving your odds and you're setting yourself up for less of a chance of being wrong. The second thing which is related to what Durgesh said, if you buy only 20 stocks in a lifetime, your selling problems also get resolved. Most people don't recognize the corollaries of what Durgesh said. But these are two very important corollaries. Because investing is, if you're right 55% of the time, I mean, you're like Ramdev Agarwal. You know, it's, it's very difficult to be right 55% of the time. Most people are blessed if they're right 51.5% of the time. And then you have guys like me who are at 48, 49. So then, you know, that, that really makes life tough. Because the other 51 you're getting wrong. So the importance of this relates to cutting down the number of times you put your head on the chopping block. That's why this is so powerful. Sure. Actually, digging through the letters of Warren Buffett, you find that 
he himself has evolved yeah. over a period of time. So some of the early letters tell you that have the purchase price be so attractive, you know. Uh, then you had the the three you know golden words: margin of safety, right? But and margin of safety was not by him. Margin of safety was, of course, uh, the biggest the, gift. Yeah. Even, I mean, he became disciple of Benjamin Graham Benjamin, because, because of these in three words. Investor, he's talked about these three most uh, what do you call uh, insightful words. Yeah. Most precious yeah. thing in investing is margin of. He didn't know how much to pay for. Yes. The value price, value is what you get. Uh, value is what you get. Price is what you pay. Yeah. So that gap between value and price is demonstrated by margin of safety. Right. And that's why he became the guru for him. And in the 50th letter now, starting from that point, he gives credit to Charlie Munger for the mm. architecture of Berkshire mm -hmm. Hathaway by saying that he gave the architecture of buying wonderful companies at a fair price versus buying a fair company at a wonderful, wonderful price. price. Right. So there's huge change. Uh, we've seen the same change in terms of your own investing style. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so uh, clearly, I mean, I've been evolving. I'm a slow learner, so every year I learn one thing. And uh, thanks to uh, guidance from all the friends. And actually, I'm learning even now. I mean, this uh, Durgesh Bhai's uh, 20 ideas. Yeah. I mean, we are doing more than 20 ideas in a, I mean, in in a, a lifetime. Not lifetime. I mean, even three, four years also, <laughs> it'll be more than 20 ideas. At a time, I might be having only 15 ideas or 17 ideas, yeah. but he's talking about in lifetime 20 ideas. I mean, yeah. bulk of the money will be made. In fact, even Buffett, I think 65, 70% of his public market money is made out of some 8, 10 ideas. I mean, I think not even 8, 10, 5, 6 ideas, if you remove, I think uh, his return ratios will be very, very mediocre, probably below the benchmark. So it's about fewer, few ideas which uh, uh, make money, but clearly after that, I have not left the pedestal of uh, uh, remaining focused in 15, 16 ideas, but I think somewhere this great good gruesome, it just blew my head okay. that there are so many bad companies, so many bad companies, because gruesome, bad company doesn't mean that your return on equity is less than cost of capital. It's about asking the manager to grow that business. If you're earning 2%, for some legacy reason, you're earning 2% return on equity, your cost of capital is 10%. But if you ask the manager and his profit is 1000 crores. So he is deployed already 50,000 crores for earning that 1,000 crores. Now you ask the manager to double the profit from 1,000 to 2,000 crores. How many thousands of crores you need? You need another 50,000 crores to earn that 1,000 crores. Mm. So that becomes the bottomless pit for the you know, bad companies. And my sense is, lot of established industrial houses, those who are successful because they hit upon one good business or one good company, they have diversified or they are still spending money on a lot of gruesome businesses. And they are yes. not under compulsion to continue with that. But probably there is no banker or there is no employee or CFO who has guts to go and tell them that, boss, you are into gruesome business, uh, you know, run away from you. So I think we see a lot of these irrational uh, things and even with the big names, investors also stuck with that. So I have, I have decided to kind of stay on the quality land, you know, and that has and that is, I think, post-2007, clearly that I just, knowingly at least I don't want to go a low-quality lane. So that has been a huge learning because of this great, good, gruesome framework which is there in 2007 letters. Adurish Bhai, how far do you walk away from uh, this attractive price in the quest for the wonderful business? No, I think we need to understand that even Buffet talks about this very clearly in terms of a long period of time. But if you see his own performance, the largest investment he's made is in the insurance business. And over the years, he's said again and again that insurance is not a great business. The return on net worth of the industry is lower than the Fortune 500 companies. So it is not that he talks about not investing. There are other examples like he bought POSCO, made money out of it. He bought PetroChina, made money out of it. So, it's not that he does not go away from that. In fact, that is something that I think uh, we need to understand. And also, he doesn't talk about buying a good business at any price. Mm. So, these two things, I think, are the most important lessons that we need to be aware of. Right. And you can see that in any market, that once a certain category of stocks tend to go overpriced for no fault of theirs, it can take a long time for the market to come back 
despite the companies showing profits, not doing anything funny. So I guess that is something that we have to be very careful about. And if your question is in terms of the temptation, then yeah. I would say that definitely is extremely difficult. He himself has said that in 99, that was the worst year in his career till then. And 2008 again was the worst year when the whole world was making money. He was having a bad year. Yeah. So that keeping that temptation out is certainly extremely difficult. Right. Sanjoy, I may be provoking you, but you have some very strong views on uh, uh, wonderful businesses. Yeah, my view is a very simple-minded view. Uh, you know, the, the wonderful businesses are understood by 99% of people to be wonderful. So unless you think you're some exceptional guy and you figure out a wonderful business that other people don't realize, you're tempting the fates. If you're, if you're even a little bit of a believer that there is a large part of the time markets are efficient, then this is going to be a massive challenge. So actually, again, I, that's why I said it at the beginning, Buffett's great strength is psychology. He buys the wonderful businesses when they fall apart. That's the real trick, fallen angels. So there's this famous one about Washington Post. <clears throat> the stock fell. And he says, you know, buying a stock is like buying a house. You look at your neighbors, you look at the locality. But volatility and risk are not the same thing. So when Washington Post, the price became half, it was still a wonderful business. So he doubled up on Washington Post. Now, for how many of us can do that? You know, if you're honest and you ask yourself, how much did you invest in <clears throat> September, October, November 2008 and Jan, Feb, March 2009? In those seven months, you were presented with the single greatest investment opportunity in your life. But if you put your hand on your heart and you ask yourself, how much money did I commit to stocks in that period? I don't know how many honest answers you will get to this. <laughs> but I think the answer will be close to zero because you're so gripped by panic. So in your mind, the devil is fear. So the cha Buffett's greatness partly lies that his mental hardwiring, his temperament is so good that he can... And of course, now the truth is that he has, as someone said, he's an icon. So he gets sweetheart deals. You know, Goldman Sachs rolls up to him. People roll up to him and say, I'm going to pay you 10% plus warrants plus... But they don't roll up to us. Because if they rolled up to me and said, I'll give you 10% and warrants, I'll take it instantly. Sanjay, that's because he's the last man standing. He's holding no, that cash. Guys. He's Who holding have... that cash. In fact, Ray Dalio has more money than Buffett. Ray Dalio manages a larger sum of money. But no one goes to Ray Dalio. Bridgewater. Okay, so it's the cultivated effort of 60, 70 years. He, he loves saying this, that the home for the permanent business is Berkshire. So what is he saying? The Israeli company Iskar came to Berkshire. He couldn't find a guy in the rest of the world. <laughs> but but uh, he has earned that reputation for you to... Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm not doubting that. Yeah. All I'm saying is very difficult for most human beings like us to do it. It's not easy for us. Yeah. Because I remember 2008 vividly. I, I was scared stiff. That was the time to buy Chrysal. That was the time to buy Asian Paints. That was the, that's when Ramdev bought Nestle. If you had bought these great businesses at that time, your investment results would have been spectacular. And then you just sat on it. But it's one thing to buy Page Industries at today's price. And one thing to have bought Page Industries then. Huge difference. He said no, very clearly, uh, you have to be greedy when others are fearful. Right. And you have to be fearful when others are greedy. That is, I think, one of his most profound One of the things. profound, and you know, one of the best uh, cash lines is that, I mean, I think it is, uh, I think it is about the crowd behavior. He said, what the wise people do in the beginning, fools do at the end. You know, a good thing starts with one guy starting doing something like, say, you start worshipping something and then you see the whole crowd just going and worshipping that. So, this buying, I think at this point of time, buying quality has become fashion. What? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think 
you know, in my entire life, it's a short life, but I've never seen an auto component company trading at 80 times earnings. <laughs> it's a new thing for me. And wise guys own it. And there are millions of justifications why this is so. It's true, Bosch is a great company. But it earned 1100, less than 1100 crores last year. And market cap is 77,000 crores. So there's something here that there's a disconnect. You know, you ask yourself, would I own 100% of the business? If someone gave you 77,000 crores, would you put that 77,000 crores into owning 100% of Bosch or something else? But, Bhatta, on that count, you had the same strong view against Nestle at 1600 also. No, no. At 1600, it was a mistake of judgment on my part. I am allowed to make mistakes here. <laughs> <laughs> I simply made a mistake. Yeah. And maybe my judgment on Bosch is wrong. Maybe it's a great buy at 77,000. No, no, I am not saying that. Who is to say? I don't know. Yeah. It's difficult to figure this out. You know, hindsight is always 2020. Yeah. No, but the very, very fact that you can't buy anything at any price. I mean, like, if, even if it is a bad company, at, at some price it is a good investment. Like that, at greatest possible company cannot buy, can, cannot be a great investment at any, any price. price. You just cannot pay. So, I think that's what the, I mean, that extreme… I, I think it's this that I'll add to that QGLP thing. Great investments are not… Great companies are not always equal to great investments. It is important to buy the great companies at reasonable prices. That's what B Manjar has said and Buffett has adopted. And as Durgesh and Ramdev were discussing, the trick is how to figure out what's reasonable. Yeah. And yeah. Buffett made a further comment here. He spoke about rhinestones and diamonds. Yeah. So yes. when you buy the great companies, you're buying diamonds. You're not going to buy them at P multiples of 12, 13, 14, 15. So if you buy Nestle at 25, you're actually doing pretty damn well because the earning power is so extreme, so rare. Or Hero Honda, which he bought. Unbelievable business, bought at a very reasonable price. And that's why 20 years later, you can see the results. The power of compounding for 20 years. I think also good company is always correct. He himself has mentioned that in 35 years, there has been three occasions when Berkshire itself fell by 50%. So, you do get opportunities to buy whatever you would Qualify like or buy. define Correct. as good companies or great companies at reasonable prices. And his ability to wait for that, the fat I pitch. think yeah. that is the big difference. Yeah. Buying the fat, you know, buying into the fat pitch. Basically the half folly outside leg stump. That's how you hit the success, not the IPL type of success. <laughs> the Indian stock market is now oriented to the IPL type of six. It's very tough to do that. It looks spectacular on TV, but if you try to do that in investing, you'll have one Brendan McCullum type of 158 or Chris Gale type of 200 and a string of scores between 0 and 10. But I think global, it's not only about India. Anywhere in the world. Same All world. the markets are like that. Yeah, but people don't understand this. I think that's the tragedy. That this point that Durgesh made, you got to wait for that perfect, that wonderful opportunity, the fat pitch. Buffett constantly talks about the fat pitch. Easy, obvious, cheap, great business, you buy into it. And at that time, this greedy, fearful thing becomes the key determinant of whether you can act. The other uh, uh, interesting uh, takeaway from one of the letters is, that are, I mean, in this world which is, you know, trigger hungry, catalyst hungry, uh, he talks about his investing approach which is to bet on lack of change mm. rather than change. Mm. Have which you been able to practice? absolutely fascinating again because yeah. it goes back to the same thing. If businesses change rapidly, then two things happen. You've got to comprehend that change, see how it affects the competitive advantage, how it affects earning power and then make another decision. And every time you make a decision, remember, it's 55%. So for those who studied probability, you know, 0.55 into 0.55 is not an attractive number. Your odds of getting it right 
are about 0.3 if you've made two decisions, but 0.55 if you made one decision. That's why the absence of change is a wonderful thing. It's absolutely key to making money. Ramji, you've practiced that? What? The lack of change. The yeah. lack of change rather than change is what the investing approach of Buffett is. Yeah, so, I mean, you have to buy the franchises, the businesses, and, and India is a unique place where you have all the growth ahead and uh, the businesses are not changing. Say, whether it is a, a paint company we talked about or uh, Nestle, I mean, they're so small right now. Like, Nestle is a dollar per person per year. Worldwide, they're, worldwide average is about $10, $15 per, per person per year for the whole world. So, I think there is a lot of growth ahead, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So, the longevity of growth in a franchise which is, which you don't have to change the franchise, they just keep punching the same Nescafe, same uh, Maggi noodles and, and same ice cream, same chocolates and they can keep making money. So, I think the, the business not changing, the technology not changing, the consumer behavior not changing, you don't have to spend a lot of money into, like telecom, you have 2G, 2G to 3G took 10 years, 3G to 4G took 3 years and 5G is staring at you before 4G has come and you need billions and billions of dollars of, uh, I mean, yeah. at this rate of change, at some point of time when I bought money, uh, I made money in Bharti, at that point of time, I thought 2G is the, I mean, the uh, gift of God, I mean, it is from wired phone to wireless phone and it is going to remain like this for whole life, that was my thinking, but uh, you know, you see what the pace of which, at which it is changing, government wants more money, so I think this entire space, uh, is going to, I mean, it is not as fertile as it was between 2000, 2001 and 2005 and after that we know what will happen because it was so fertile that a lot of other people started, non-telecom guys entered the fray and we had 3G scan. So, I think uh, uh, we need that uh, stability, predictability of the business model so that uh, you can see last 15 years so that you can predict the next 15 years. And that's where I think, uh, uh, like HDFC, I mean from 78 till date, it's still as fresh as relevant and still nothing has changed. But let me give you a simple example, you know, because maybe because of my own inadequacy, I love these examples, but they're also instructive. So this moat thing, it's a wonderful thing because it's a four letter word. So everyone loves moats, you know, four letter words are popular. And <clears throat> Buffett has this happy knack of focusing on four letter words. So newspapers, this is one of the businesses he bought in droves, the Buffalo News, Still and the Omaha right. Herald and Washington yeah, Post. Now, yes. He bought millions of newspapers. But you know what happened there? Change came about through technology, the internet. And it destroyed one of his best investments ever, the Washington Post, which Jeff Bezos of Amazon bought at a throwaway price. So it's very difficult. You know, it's very easy to say rate of change must be slow. But sometimes you can't understand what is driving change. Leadership habits are something that are very difficult to decipher. I think somewhere uh, the consumer product companies, because uh, whatever is consumed around a human being, human being is same at least for last hundred years and next hundred years, I'm not talking about next million years, so that's not the investing horizon. Yeah. So anything being consumed or uh, by human body, particularly eating and all, I mean, like, you eat the same chapati, same chewing gum, same chocolates. So I think that allows, if you have a franchise there, I think uh, that around human being is the, uh, you know, non-changing type. If something is relevant for last 30, 40 years, most likely you have a much better probability that it will not change for many years to come. And that's why the longevity is valued. You know, in any valuation you do as a, uh, a discount, dividend discount model, or right. earnings discount model, Clearly, if you, if you grow something for instead of 10 years, for 20 years, or 30 years, or 40 years, I mean, your present value can be significantly higher. And that's why some of these franchises, which has longevity uh, and uh, slow rate of change, high profitability, slow rate of change, in a very highly competitive situation. Like Colgate, I mean, they have, they're winning the world in terms of their dental uh, uh, products. So here, I think half the population doesn't uh, uh, I think they don't use the formal toothpaste or uh, then they don't use it twice and then the premarization. Nothing is changing. So they'll keep making money, they'll keep distributing dividends. So those kind of franchises will definitely have higher valuation. So understanding at early stage, by chance, some, these kind of franchises are not born every day. But when these franchises are born, market doesn't appreciate fully. 
And if you have insight about those kind of franchises, like very recently we saw one of the franchise which got valued big time is Aisha, the Royal Enfield. I think it was down and out. I used to think, who the hell is going to uh, ride this fatfadia and you know kind of pay for it? You see what is happening today. It has become the most profitable two wheeler, and so much so, what he makes three lakhs, we pay forty five thousand crores market cap. The guy who makes six million, six and a half million, you can get it for fifty five thousand crores. So that's the kind of power of monopoly and consumer monopolies. I don't know if your question is to do with disruption. Yes. I think uh, the point that one is not able to justify or understand a valuation of a Google or a Facebook that one can live with because something that you don't own can't hurt you. But if you own something that is going to get impacted because of the disruption, right. like the World Book for Buffet got impacted or Washington Post, that I think is extremely important. So if I own a company which is going to get hurt because of disruption, that is something that I think we have no choice but to try and understand. Mm -hmm. Like Kodak got hit. Correct. That's another beautiful example. Yeah. So right. I think that's, that's the important part. It, it may not be necessary for me to understand everything that's happening in a new area. It's not easy anyway. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.